anonymous. That's thing, Frank. Hey, but he we're going to grow some food and food. Food. Is everybody in this town will be in the class. We are now running about two minutes behind time. Oh, my name my is God. Tim. I'm going to be doing AV support tonight, and our moderator will be uh, Brown, who is catching in the uh, catching in on the uh, thing. Let's go to a, we have three things we do. Here. A little more. Okay, I'll get that. But after we we'll once we do the announcements. Um, the college format is in three formats. We have an announcements period. The speaker speaks. There's a Q&A period. Then we have an infamous rebuttal period. There are two rules. Number one, we don't, we don't, no personal attacks. And number two is one fall at a time. So let's get right at it. And again, Brown, stand up because he's our moderator tonight. Let's give him a round of applause real quick. And I, I heard that we're actually having a speaker tonight. Yes, yes. John Abel, our director of Plan Chicago. <coughs> if you're ready, come on up and give him a minute. Uh, John Abel is, is doing a uh, responsible green production with a 95,000 square foot retired meat packing facility. The plant is a net zero energy vertical farm, a complex and highly integrated system with one third of the plant will hold aquaponic growing systems and the other two thirds will incubate sustainable food businesses by offering low rent, low energy costs, and a licensed shared kitchen. To tell us more about it, take it away. Have you all heard what the format is? Yeah. Tell uh, us the again. rules. Yeah. yeah. One rule, one rule at a time, and we don't insult anybody here no. or their mothers. No. All right. All right. One rule at a time. Mr. Abel? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Wow. Uh, so there's a lot of material here, and uh, two different projects that we're going to go over that uh, that lay out how we got where we are right now and where we're going with it. So uh, without further ado, uh, the first project, Bubbly Dynamics, is uh, a building that's about 25,000 square foot, formerly derelict uh, warehouse in Bridgeport in the Central Manufacturing District, which is Chicago's, uh, actually I'm sorry, the, the Western Hemisphere's first planned industrial park. Uh, starting around 1898, uh, the CMD, the Central Manufacturing District, was laid out as a, uh, a haven for industry with... Uh, curbs and pavement and street lights and all sorts of wonderful things that we didn't have in other factories and rail service absolutely everywhere. This is what it looked like. So this building was about as bad as they get. And uh, we, uh, we had to do quite a bit of work uh, on this one. Uh, but it was cheap. And, uh, and that's a, a very good starting point. So I looked at this and I said, well, it's got beautiful capitals on the columns. Uh, it's solid concrete, and uh, the price is right, and it's got a railroad siding. So that's what attracted me initially. Uh, as, uh, uh, as we started to do the work here, actually, in pulling out this galvanized steel window frame with the come along of the column, that's what the chain is there, uh, that kind of gives you a sense of what was in there. There was a, a fairly nasty bunch of uh, uh, white power bikers uh, squatting in the building, and uh, we had to get rid of them, and uh, there were, uh, there's a guy named Cowboy who luckily, right about the time I bought the building, was put in prison for life, actually in the witness protection program, because he ratted out Joe Calabrese, who's the oh. notorious mafia, uh, but Joe was his protector, and so it's not really a very good idea. Cowboy wasn't terribly bright, and um, there was Santa Claus, who was actually a great guy. Santa came around... Uh, I kept him around for quite a while, actually. Uh, he would uh, he would trade with me for things, so I would give him my scrap metal, and he would bring me torches or pallet racks or something, whatever I needed. He was a good guy. Uh, then there was Googs and the Boob and uh, and Mac. There were some interesting folks around. So this is you know this is a starting point for a project, and I wanted to start with something that other people would look at and say, what are you crazy? Because that's usually what people say to me. And um, I thought, well, if you can prove that a building that is so far gone can be brought back, then you remove excuses. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, too, when it comes to energy and, and things that we can do with buildings nowadays. Uh, removing the excuses for why corporations and other people aren't going a little bit farther than they are. 
So how do you do this? Well, uh, building a community, that's the biggest one. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a commuter bicyclist. I always have been for, I don't know, 25 years or something like that, right through the winters. And uh, through that community, I was able to meet uh, a lot of other people who uh, may have thought I was crazy, but they wanted to help uh, or try to bail me out in some way or another. So we started to have uh, events, Cycling Sisters. Uh, we were training folks how to repair bicycles in the building, <coughs> the rat patrol. We built a, uh, a bike shop in the basement uh, for people building uh, choppers out of, uh, out of trash, basically, gathered in the alleys. Uh, and then other people started to come, too, and uh, just who wanted to learn, or who pe people who stare at a computer all day, and they wanted to come and get their hands dirty and do something real for a while. Uh, that eventually morphed into more and more skilled people. So this gentleman here is uh, Yuval Owasu, Yubi, who's uh, also a bike builder, but he is, in this photo, fabricating our stainless steel handrails that are made from tubing salvaged from a brewery, um, restaurant sink, well actually the discs aren't in there yet, but uh, pieces of salvaged, scrapped restaurant sink, um, and some other stuff. Uh, the whole building is, is done with uh, a very high waste stream content. And that's, that's important in, the, in this model, is look for what you have, not what you think you need, uh, and, uh, and use what you have. So here we're, we're installing a green roof on the building. The roof is 5,200 square feet, uh, which is a lot bigger than it actually looks right there. Uh, and uh, that's a lot of material. So we had uh, tons of volunteers came to, to do that. That was a fun project. Uh, this is the last of the planting of it here. We planted it like a gigantic dot matrix printer starting at the top and running our way right down uh, to, the, to the south end of it. This is the planting diagram. So. Um, I went to, uh, you know, I, to do a green roof, you've got to go through the city, you've got to get permits, you've got to do, in this case, we had to do ground penetrating radar to see where all the rebar was to reverse engineer the building so we knew that it could support the load, right? Well, they do collapse, so it's good to do that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I went to a friend of mine who's an architect uh, because we needed to submit plans to get through the city permitting process. And I was thinking, let's have a spiral path or something naturalistic or whatever. <laughs> So he comes back to me with a photo of my own daughter and says, this is what we're going to plant on your roof. And I said, what? <laughs> uh, that's a great idea. So, uh, so we did that. And um, it, really, uh, it really worked quite well. This was an idea that actually came from an intern in his office. Interns sometimes have the, the best ideas. So on the right here, this is, uh, these are strips of the planting diagram so that we knew as we were running down the roof five rows at a time. This is 9,600 pixels. Uh, actually, this image isn't as high resolution as we, this one we ended up using. 9,600 individual sedum plants that all had to be precisely placed, right? So uh, I made these colored strips here so we knew how to do that, and then made a, a thing out of string and wood that we could run down to see to make the grid. Uh, that's the result. Wow. So uh, check Google Maps and, and see, uh, wow. see 1048 West 37th Street. There's Zoe uh, when she was a baby, and she's now six years old. So uh, that was a fun project. Uh, a few shots in the interior here. Um, it is a uh, it's a very pleasant place. A lot of bright colors. A lot of open areas. Uh, this is a workshop in the building. It's full of uh, people that make things. Fabricators. Um, furniture makers, people that do stuff. Uh, there are a couple of offices, but for the most part, it's people making stuff. Uh, this is the third floor. We do, uh, we have meetings there occasionally with uh, local industrial retention initiative meetings and, and other things, trainings. Uh, we have, we've had panel discussions for artists before uh, up in the buildings. So that's, you know, you saw the first picture of how derelict it was. Well, that's what it looks like now. It came out pretty well. So that was done, and uh, I basically found myself uh, having very, very long breakfasts and long lunches and uh, being kind of bored. And um, so trying to figure out what to do. During, by the way, during that whole project, I was working full time. I was a set designer. I worked in television for a long time. And um, so I was doing that project on the side. Eventually, I left my day job, maybe five years ago or six years ago or something. Uh, and was just working on the building to get it finished, to get it rented, to get the income going. That building is 100% full, has been 100% full right through the whole recession, and has a waiting list to get in. 
Uh, why is it like that? It's like that because it's a very pleasant place. It has big common areas. It has interesting people uh, and uh, a landlord who isn't very good at collecting rent. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, the business part of it is that it's uh, so, uh, so about 35 years ago or so, uh, as a regular visitor to the Garfield Park Conservatory with my parents and my grandmother, uh, many years ago, some of you may remember, it was a pretty derelict place, actually, with a lot more broken glass and rust and leaking steam pipes and water coming down through it. Uh, that image of plants in a kind of decayed industrial environment is one of the more powerful images to me. I, I've, always, uh, I've always enjoyed that, you know, that juxtaposition of those two things. So in the, in the back of my mind, I've always been thinking about how do you grow in factories? How do you grow plants in factories? And making, you know, filling sketchbooks um, 35 years ago with drawings of what it would look like to grow palms and banana plants or whatever, I wasn't thinking about food production. I was thinking about a nice place to live that was pretty inside. So about uh, about six, five or six years ago, I started to think more seriously about food production in factory buildings, uh, partly as a way to reuse buildings, because yes, you can fill uh, an old warehouse with uh, lofts, you know, uh, uh, condos or something like that. Not interesting. Uh, yes, you can fill it with uh, artists potentially. Did that once to a certain extent, it's not terribly interesting either. What can you do to fill a building uh, even more uh, with more stuff and fill larger and larger buildings in order to partly to preserve them? So I uh, started thinking about doing it with, with plants and with, uh, with growing things inside. So um, I worked with the city for about a year and three quarters to acquire this building. This is one of the board of former Board of Education buildings which were originally uh, U.S. Army Depot on Pershing Road, 1819 West Pershing, 605,000 square feet each. There are three of them, and um, they're beautiful buildings that are as solid today as they were in 1917 when they were built. And um, they were going to sell it to me for a dollar, which I thought was a pretty good deal. Except when you buy something for the city from the city for a dollar, it isn't really a dollar. It has lots of strings attached to it. But uh, despite having built support at every level of city government, including the mayor's office, right down through all of the commissioners of Department of Environment, General Services, Planning, a um, bunch of other ones. Uh, the alderman in that ward uh, wants to tear this down and have a Walmart. That was his dream. So uh, it's still there, by the way. It hasn't gone anywhere. Because the city got a quote. It's going to be $8 million to tear it down, right? So $8 million to get to a vacant lot. That's how well built it is. Um, anyway, after uh, going to every single fundraiser he had and um, showing up at other fundraisers, who, who he just he? he wouldn't listen to me. Cardinus, George Cardinus, Cardinus yeah. 12th yeah. Ward, yeah. uh, wouldn't listen to me, and um, so I had to I had to cut and run at a certain point and, and start looking for something else. But before we did that, uh, I put a fair amount of effort and found other people to help put a fair amount of effort into figuring out how to reuse one of those buildings as a vertical farm and how to grow inside of it and how to start to match that with other tenants and other uses uh, to start to close some energy loops. So we did a lot of interesting work, um, partly working with uh, some students from the Illinois Institute of Technology and uh, a professor over there, Blake Davis, uh, and also just friends who are interested. So we started growing in the basement of Bubbly Dynamics, the Sustainable Manufacturing Center, and, uh, and learning what we could about indoor uh, hydroponic, aquaponic uh, agriculture. Aquaponics is a combination of aquaculture, where you're raising fish, and hydroponics. So we did experiments. This is aeroponic in the front, where we're spritzing the roots which are hanging in air. We're spritzing them with uh, sprinkled water, basically, which is a very, very efficient way of growing things. Um, some drip irrigation hydroponic back there. Then we had some uh, bell siphons. We tried a lot of different things uh, growing in the basement. Raised a lot of different crops on a fairly small scale. Had about, uh, I don't know, maybe 200 tilapia in the tank, something like that. So, uh, after a year and three quarters of trying to get the big building to get going, uh, I said, nope, not, not going to happen. So I asked a friend of mine who happens to be a residential real estate broker who I know from Playgroup, 
uh, what's out there? What's out there on the open market in the industrial world that might work for what I want to do? And what she came back to me the very same day, I think, uh, was uh, with was this. Uh, this is a 93,500 square foot former pork packing plant on 46th Street, 1400 West 46th Street. So it's right at the edge of the stockyards. Yep. And uh, it was built in 1925 by the Bueller brothers, uh, who are actually the ones I bought it from, or their descendants anyway. And uh, it employed 400 people 24-7 uh, uh, for, uh, well, 80-something years. And um, was in pretty tough shape. The broker described it as a pile. And uh, he told me that it was a, uh, a strip and rip. Uh, what that means is you strip the stainless steel out and you rip it down. And the value of the building is essentially the stainless steel inside. So um, I looked at it and I said, wow, that's a food grade building. That's got floor drains everywhere. That's got stainless steel everywhere. That's got all these things that would make this the best farm I could ever imagine. And it's a concrete frame building. It's not a wood, it's not a timber frame building. So uh, that was about a year and a half ago that I closed on it, July 1st, a little bit better. Uh, bought the building for $525,000 on a three-acre lot, uh, which is pretty darn cheap. Uh, it works out to $5.50 or something like that a square foot, which is not very much money at all uh, when you're talking about this kind of a building. So we've started, uh, we started immediately working on it, of course. Uh, new windows, you'll notice. 90-something 90, 90 brand-new fiberglass frame, super-efficient, triple-pane, manufactured right on 46th Street windows went in. Uh, this is what it's going to look like eventually. We're going to be uh, putting in a lobby in the front, uh, taking out some of the internal truck docks, moving the docks to the back of the building, mm -hmm. and uh, building a growing lobby where we can have our proper ADA access and, and, other, uh, and other things. Uh, and then building a living wall up the front and adding greenhouses on the far side that wrap around part of the roof. So about uh, 6,000 square feet of greenhouse. So to do this, we've got this kind of dual structure here, where Bubbly Dynamics uh, is the shadowy underworld corporation that actually owns the building, That's, and then I own Bubbly Dynamics. Uh, and then Plant Chicago uh, nonprofit uh, is the one that operates the building. And so our nonprofit arm uh, is doing the, uh, doing the research and disseminating information and building out the farm and, 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 uh, and those are in the shared kitchens. So. Um, we're, uh, you know, we're setting out to with a pretty, pretty large list of things we're trying to accomplish with this. You know, we're trying to create jobs. That's kind of a, a, um, a collateral damage from doing all this is that we happen to be making 125 jobs in, a, in an economically distressed neighborhood. So that wasn't, you know, that that's just something that's a great benefit that comes out of doing this kind of work. So, um, so what it looks like inside, parts of it. Uh, you can see some of the rails hanging here from uh, where they used to move carcasses, hog carcasses around and whatnot. Um, pretty rough inside. Uh, so what makes this interesting and what makes this not just renovating another building is that uh, we're going to be net zero. And the way we're going to get there uh, is, is fairly involved, but it isn't actually all that involved. There's absolutely nothing that we're doing at the plant that is new. We are taking older concepts and ideas. Aquaponics has been around for a very long time. Anaerobic digestion has been around for a long time. Burning gas in an engine to make electricity has been around for a very long time. Uh, but for some reason, absorption chillers, by the way, have been around since 1857. Uh, there's nothing particularly brand new. It's just the combination all under one roof of all of these things that are going to get us there. So uh, the plant is about closing loops. That's the, that's the primary takeaway, closing loops. So you take the output of one business, uh, the waste product of one business, and you find a business that needs that as their input, whether it's grains, whether it's carbon dioxide, oxygen, um, something else, lots of things I can't think of. Um, you know, food waste, all of these things can be, can be recycled into the inputs of something else. Uh, so heat from uh, grow lights, for instance. So we're all about figuring out how to close those loops. I'll talk a little bit more about the energy later here. This is a, this is a neat little diagram that uh, my friend Matt Bergstrom uh, put together for us. 
which uh, explains something about this. And you can study, you can see this on our website, and you can study it in more detail there. Um, but uh, but you can see, you know, it's it's loops, it's lots of loops. So at the plant, the mantra is nothing leaves but food. Period. You know, and maybe some styrofoam food tubs and plastic forks and things like that that we can't digest, but nothing else leaves except food. So uh, the, the way the energy system basically works is that we're going to be taking in roughly 32 tons a day, every day, of food waste. Some of it's going to come from the building internally, from the brewery, commercial brewery, New Chicago Beer Company that's setting up on site, uh, the food businesses. That's where a, a fraction of it will come from. The majority of it will come from neighboring food industries like Vantage Oleochemicals, who are a big fat rendering plant next door. Uh, and they have this horrible gloppy substance when they clean out their rendering vats that is not saleable oil. It's stuff that they pay to dispose of. Every other small brewery in the city, like Revolution and, and other ones, all uh, don't have quite enough grain to be worth getting a giant truck to get it out to agricultural use, but shipping it inside the city is very cost effective. Uh, and so we're going to be taking in brewer's grains and food waste from all these places, putting it in an anaerobic digester, which is like a giant stomach. In this case, it's a plug flow, uh, which um, looks kind of like this. This one happens to be on a farm. Uh, but the company that's doing this portion of the, of the project for us is Eisenman, and it's a, it's a German company that's built hundreds of digesters, all of them in Europe, and none of them in the United States yet. So this will be the first Eisenman digester in the States and the first digester in the city. Uh, so basically, stuff goes in one end, takes about 30 days to get to the other end of the stainless steel tank. Then we uh, run it through a screw press, which will knock the, the liquid liquid digestate out of it. Uh, we'll take the solid digestate from there and we'll go on to a covered pad where it will be eventually sold as a soil amendment. It's a rich fertilizer. Uh, we're, we've got offers on that already, $10 a cubic yard, uh, people that want to buy it from us. Uh, the liquid goes into the secondary digester vessel which will be 54 feet in diameter and 25 feet high that will, uh, has a rubber double membrane rubber roof that rises and falls with gas pressure and that's where the liquid will sit and continue to off-gas, uh, making methane, essentially biogas. This is mostly methane. Uh, that will go into a turbine. Not one that's pretty like this and open like this, or anywhere near this size, but uh, ours is coming from, a, uh, from an airliner. It's, uh, it's an auxiliary power unit from a 747. It's a scrap piece of scrap metal that's uh, been remanufactured for us. Whoops. Um, and uh, is um, being installed by somebody in Barry Stonehouse from Elcor Energy Solutions with phase synchronized generating equipment. So we'll be grid tied and making, actually selling power back to ComEd most of the time, renewable energy as a matter of fact. Uh, so that engine will make a lot of heat. Its exhaust goes into a steam boiler. This, by the way, is arriving in two weeks. I've got a lot of work to do. Uh, it's arriving in two weeks along with the giant steam boiler that takes the exhaust of the turbine, turns it into steam. The steam will go into a couple different places. It'll go to the brewery to brew the beer. We're talking about three and a half million BTU uh, per hour of, uh, of steam here. So that's a, lot of, that's a lot of energy. It's enough to run a big commercial brewery. Um, then it will also go into the absorption chiller, which is a thing that takes waste heat and makes cold and that cold will be used to cool the building. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and then any extra waste, there's, uh, there's lots of other things you can do with waste heat. So, um, uh, so basically by bringing the energy generation on site, sometimes called cogen, or in this case combined heat and power, you get to, uh, you get to remove all of the transportation losses. So when, you're, uh, when you make power at uh, Zion or Clinton or some big plant someplace, you lose half of it by the time it gets to the end user. <coughs> and when they make that energy, even though they're making it in a very efficient way, they're blowing all that waste heat out into the atmosphere instead of doing something productive with it. And what do you get mostly? You get mostly waste heat and some <coughs> electricity when you, make, uh, when you make power. So if you do it on site and you burn something, you can burn natural gas, you can burn uh, coal, you can burn anything you want, but uh, when you make your electricity on site, 
you lose the, uh, or you don't lose, I'm sorry, the, the, trans, uh, the transportation losses or the, uh, uh, thank you, transmission losses of, uh, of the electricity, and you get to keep all the waste heat and do something productive with it, like heat your building. So, um, that's not related. Uh, so, anyway, that's, uh, that's what we're going to be doing. And, and so we're hoping that people will take pieces of our energy plan and maybe just install a, uh, a cogen center system in their building. A lot of people are doing that on larger scales. It's going to be coming down and down and down to, to closer to residential scales eventually. Uh, so uh, what do we do? We reuse absolutely everything. And um, you see the bottom line, we filled two dumpsters in a year and a half of renovation, a pretty intense renovation. That's nothing uh, and for this large of a project. And um, we take wall panels, we take, you know, things that you look at, everybody looks at it and says, well, it's trash. We find a way to use it as a, as a building material in something or com recombined in some way. Uh, all over the building are these evaporators, you know, giant refrigeration units in, in the units, because the whole building was a big refrigerator, right? And uh, instead of taking those out and putting in a whole new heating and air conditioning system, we're reusing those evaporators and all of the piping, and it has three pipes. Uh, to each evaporator where it sits and uh, and we're able to do that uh, because we're switching the system over to water, hot and cold water, so we can cool and heat and uh, it's going to be pretty efficient. And we don't even have to buy any new equipment. It's kind of amazing. Uh, this is Dave. A lot of what we do at the plant is get very, very dirty, uh, taking apart <coughs> pipes, plasma cutting, uh, doing, uh, doing endless amounts of salvage work. And uh, uh, pipes, old pipe, if we can't reuse it on site, and we have miles and miles and miles of pipe, then we'll send it to scrap. But, you know, that's good because it gets recycled and turned into cash. Here we're cutting apart, plasma cutting a, uh, a smokehouse. This is a, a, uh, a $3 million piece of equipment. It operated for about four years before they shut the facility down. Uh, but unfortunately, they took all of the, the fancy bits off of it and it's 40 feet long, or was 40 feet long and 13 and a half feet wide, and there's no way to get it out of the building without tearing the building down. So um, it's, it, we're reusing pieces of it, like the stainless steel panels off the outside. We're bending into backsplashes and tabletops and things like that. And then this end piece, this end 10 feet of it, is now an office, actually. So with the, well, the doors aren't on it here, but it's beautiful stainless steel double doors that go on it and lots of interesting smoke jets inside. Um, this is actually where that smokehouse sat. Uh, so, you know, we've got roof leaks, we've got all sorts of other fun old building problems. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're working through all of that. Uh, here we are tearing out uh, ceilings and things and, and uh, this is a room that still has the original rail system in it which we're keeping wherever we can because it's really pretty cool. <laughs> Uh, that's Blake Davis from IIT jackhammering, and uh, we do a lot of jackhammering at the plant. Uh, this is the main brew hall for New Chicago Brewing, and uh, uh, their equipment should be arriving in the not too distant future. So uh, I think by by June or July there'll be uh, commercial brewing happening in there. So. Um, Bubbly Dynamics, the other building, has always been a, it's a green business incubator, right? So there are these small businesses in there that use a lot of recycled materials and whatnot. Um, at the plant, we're focusing exclusively on food businesses. They can brew, too. I mean, it's food. But um, we are uh, uh, focusing specifically on kitchen spaces. So building shared kitchens, uh, building permanent kitchen spaces that are, in some cases, co-opt or it's just one tenant ranging in size from 500 to 2,000 square feet and uh, trying to get all of these people together in one space so that they can share ideas and they can say, gee, who do you get your insurance from? And I'm having this problem with inspectors. What's, you know, your experience? Uh, because it helps all of them. This is one of the spaces that, uh, uh, this is the way it looked when we moved in, actually. This was the nicest part of the building. It was in actually very good condition. We've since reopened windows. They bricked up almost all the windows and covered them over. So, you know, the building was pitch black inside uh, and, uh, and pretty depressing. So that's why we unbricked all the windows and put in 90, 90 new windows. Uh, that same space, uh, you can see natural light in there now, some walls that we're building. Some of that is recycled material, not all of it. Uh, 
This is De La Rue Patisserie, which is a new uh, building, I'm sorry, new business in the building. They are a commercial bakery. They operate uh, seven days a week, making croissants, making um, macaroni, these beautiful little French cookies and bagels. And so they're there every night, uh, baking all night. And uh, there's about five people, I think, that work for the company, so that's five jobs now in that, in that small space. <coughs> And um, it was exciting for us because that was our first bakery that moved in. Some of what they make, very delicious. Uh, so, um, moving on from the food business incubator to the farm side of it, uh, mycology is a big part of what we're doing because mushrooms uh, consume waste and so they fit in pretty nicely at the plant. Uh, Paul Stamets, if you haven't heard of him, is, uh, is, is the world's most, uh, foremost expert on the subject. Um, but, uh, but we're using mushrooms to do a little remediation in the backyard of an oil spot. Uh, we are growing them in a couple places in the building, including accidentally in a few places like the <laughs> here. That's a, I believe that's an oyster mushroom. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's, it just appeared one day, you know. I looked down, I was like, oh, there's a mushroom. Uh, so uh, we have a laboratory in the building, which is a real, honest to goodness, two room laboratory with fume hoods and eye wash station and shower and all this stuff and acid resisting furniture because it was a meatpacking plant, so they had to have a laboratory. It's an awfully handy thing when you're trying to be a mycologist. So um, it's sterile, they don't actually let me in there at all, and I uh, <laughs> haven't been there in a while. Um, so uh, the, the primary part of the farm side of this is aquaponics. Again, that's the combination of aquaculture and hydroponics. And it's a continuously recirculating system. So you have evaporative and transpirative losses of water, but basically not much water is lost in the system. It just keeps going round and round. Uh, we have fish tanks, which are recycled, uh, sometimes kosher glycerin or molasses or palm oil totes that we get from a, a local bakery, Schultze and Birch. They make toaster pastries, and uh, they send us periodically truckloads of these gigantic plastic tanks, uh, which are very useful. So anyway, the fish live in these tanks, tilapia in this case, and uh, their waste goes through something called a, a solids filter. First we go through a solids filter to knock out the solids, uh, then the waste goes into the water, I should say, goes into a biofilter, which is where most of the bacteria live, and the biofilter converts the ammonia, which is fish urine, into nitrites and then nitrites. And that's what plants eat. And the water continues down the chain and feeds the plants. Uh, this, is, uh, this is growing bed number one. And uh, it's lighted with LEDs, that's why it's all interesting colors. And uh, plants can't see green, so there's absolutely no point in making green light. So if you're making white light, you're throwing away a third of the spectrum, right? Because they, they don't need that. So uh, with LEDs, you just you just make blue and red light, and uh, they're pretty darn efficient, but they're really really expensive. So these were donated. These are a uh, thousand or twelve hundred dollars each each of these lights. So luckily they were donated. Um, so these are some of the tanks that we use, and uh, uh, we got fish up on the left. The water goes through the sedimentation filter, the biofilter out to the bed comes back, goes to a, a pump reservoir where the water is, is heated to a nice fish temperature like 72 degrees or 75 or so, uh, and then back to the fish, and round and round it goes. Uh, with the LEDs off, the plants are actually green, and they taste very, very good, as a matter of fact, because aquaponics, unlike hydroponics, is a living water system, and so you've got much more uh, stuff in there. You've got microbes, you've got all kinds of things in that water that you don't get in the hydroponic system. And so our arugula is phenomenal. Uh, so what are we doing right now? Uh, a lot of things. A lot and a lot, a lot of things. Uh, we have tenants moving in like mad. Uh, some of them are growing operations, some of them are, are uh, food operations. And uh, we are uh, trying to get the combined heat and power room ready because this stuff arrives in less than two weeks and we have a long ways to go. Uh, so there's a lot of construction going on all over the place. Uh, we are doing a fair amount of education. Actually, we're starting up an After School Matters program. We've done uh, classes for biology students, high school biology students from the neighborhood. We're in the back of the yards. And, uh, 
uh, that's been that's been very successful. Uh, the goal here is again to teach people about food and hope uh, hope that once people know where their food comes from and uh, they'll start to appreciate it and we'll, we'll see more higher quality food. Um, our knowledge base and the research that we're doing, while we haven't done a very good job of it yet, the plan is to put all of that up on the web for free uh, access for everybody that wants it to learn how to take derelict industrial buildings anywhere uh, and use them for agriculture and X, that being office space, manufacturing, food businesses, residential, whatever. Uh, because the concept, there's a little digression here, but the concept of a vertical farm, uh, if any of you have ever heard of Dixon Despommier and this, this concept of these beautiful glass skyscraper vertical farms, you know, 60 story, um, beautiful buildings in Manhattan or wherever, they don't exist. They don't make any sense, unfortunately. Um, and uh, uh, they're tremendously inefficient concept. So we have to, first off, walk before we can run, and it makes a lot more sense to do it in used buildings. So they're talking about $750 to $1,000 a square foot construction costs for these glass vertical farms. So I bought the building for $5.50, $5.50 a square foot, you know. We got a little headroom on that. So, um, Anyway, we're trying to we're trying to figure out the realities, the on the ground realities of how can you do this best and get that information out there to the general public so that other people will be encouraged to do it wherever they are. Um, so uh, we're doing a lot of outreach. We're doing a lot of um, uh, well, we started a film screening. Uh, thing that happens roughly once a month or whenever we get around to it, uh, generally involving a panel discussion afterwards. This one, I think, was uh, sponsored by the Young Aggies, who are a, uh, a group in town who are uh, obviously young agricultural people. And uh, the first one we had, I think, maybe 170 people show up uh, you know, on a freezing cold night. Uh, to a meatpacking plant in back of the yard. That was impressive. I think this one was uh, uh, something like 140 people showed up. And uh, it's great. Uh, we're doing a little bit of, this is a little art show, but these, this isn't really art. These are uh, concepts done by graduate architecture students at the Illinois Institute of Technology for our site and how the plant relates <coughs> to the community, to back of the yards. and. Uh, how does it relate to the people and the families, and how do we get our food out there and our message out there? And so we had a very bright group of, uh, I think, maybe 12 graduate students who worked all semester on some pretty amazing concepts. So they're hanging in our what's going to be the tasting room for the brewery. Uh, this was, uh, this was a tour, so we, we give tours uh, three days a week, actually I think it's going to be two days a week shortly, but Thursdays and Saturdays at 2 o'clock. Uh, anybody's welcome. Uh, so we're also incubating some other smaller growing operations. Some of them, this one is the only one that's just straight hydroponic, the other ones are all aquaponic. And uh, we've got a lot of microgreens starting to come out, and arugula, and baby arugula, and, and other things, kale, chard. Um, basil, watercress, parsley, you name it. Uh, this is a, uh, a concept for a rooftop system, rooftop module system. Uh, so you know, we're, we're trying a lot of different things and making space for people to experiment because it's critical for, uh, for people to try stuff and to give them space to try stuff. And if they fail, they fail, and that's fine too. Uh, so we're documenting, you see the camera in the middle there. There's always cameras around at the plant. It's kind of disturbing sometimes. We had, I was trying to give a, uh, we're trying to have a meeting with the engineers uh, one day and we were being followed around by two cameras and somebody from WBEZ. And the, the whole thing was just, it was a media circus. It was kind of amazing. Um, it's just kind of pretty, that's all. <clears throat> so, um, so basically, uh, it's a, uh, <laughs> it's a it's a it's a very large project that touches on a whole lot of different things. It touches on job creation. It touches on en renewable energy, uh, food systems, uh, <clears throat> preservation, historic preservation, which is actually a big motivating factor for me personally, and why I do a lot of what I do is I'm trying to find ways to keep some of 
Chicago's industrial heritage alive and visible. Uh, and, um, and there's no better place to do that than the stockyards and packing towns. Uh, so um, lots of people have found their own little niche to fit into at the plant. And, uh, and on any given day, there are tons of people there. So today, I think we had uh, 12 or 15 volunteers showed up and, uh, and plenty of other people <coughs> doing all kinds of fun stuff. So, um, so with that, I guess I'd like to open it up to questions. Specifically, but there are plenty of other organizations that have, and particularly schools. But 4-H, you know, we'd certainly be happy to talk to them. But I know they have some things here in the city. I don't know where. Okay. Okay. George Smolka. Hello. Uh, uh, John, I, I have about 72 questions. I'll okay. try to limit them. One will do. Relax. <laughs> um, first of all, the roof, what is the roof made out of? Not the outer layer, the, the, the substrate on the roof. Well, there's a concrete. It's, it's, it's concrete. concrete. It's a concrete. Yeah, concrete. it's pretty heavy duty. Uh, so, you said that there were leaks. How are you taking care of those? Uh, we're, we're repairing the existing roofing. We're, we don't have enough money right now to replace it all. So it's an EPDM roof, which we're we're patching essentially to get through. We're going to be putting 6,000 square feet of greenhouse over a chunk of it. The total roof area is about 28,000 28, square feet. Okay. Uh, and so uh, so we're you know we're trying to limp it along until we can find a bunch of money to replace the rest of it. Although we'll be growing on every inch of it. All right. Um, I have way too many questions, but I'd like to talk to you about technical aspects of it afterward. Okay, Will sure. you have time? Laura Chamberlain. Yeah, okay, great. I wanted to know, in your uh, searching around for this building, uh, did you see like hundreds and hundreds of buildings like this in Chicago? That's my sense of it. Okay, that's my first question. And my second question is, I'm a, I'm a vegetarian. Like, did you have to like just bleach bomb this thing to get the smell out? Like, I, it's just a question. I, I'm starting to get a little nauseated even thinking about it. So, <laughs> let me address that one first, actually, because we have quite a few vegans who who work at the plant and. Uh, to them, it's like going into the belly of the beast. And <laughs> there are certain places that are very smoky smelling still. Uh, because they were smoking 24-7 in there, you know, in massive industrial scale. And so uh, it doesn't come out easily. Uh, when we were cutting up the smokehouses, uh, periodically we would get doused in au jus uh, as we were doing it. And, uh, and just, you know, there, and there, there are a lot of a lot of cases, you know, you grab something that nobody's grabbed in a while and find all sorts of fat globules on it or something like that. Anyway, it's not that bad. Um, but, kind of. Um, <laughs> no, it's, uh, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a cleansing thing. I mean, and, and it is, uh, luckily, meatpacking plants are made out of very much aseptic materials that do not really hold stuff and they can be cleaned and, and to your food credit they cleaned it very well uh, I mean they were required to so when it when they shut down everything was very clean and what was your, your first question yeah, about did other you buildings? see uh, you know lots of buildings around Chicago that might be suitable well uh, there are but unfortunately our city has a history of tearing them down well they're still warm inside you know I mean it, they, it happens so quickly and, and that's been the case through every administration uh, and it's very frustrating because we've, we've, you know, Chicago, we've torn down more fabulous architecture than we've seen other cities even have. So um, I have looked at quite a few, and I've seen some that I looked at disappear very quickly, including ones that I put offers on to purchase and was told uh, the Link Belt Crane Factory at Western and 18th, for instance, which is a beautiful building, was a beautiful building, was torn down, the guy said, oh, you can't do anything with that. It just needs to be torn down. I'm just going to tear it down. You don't, you don't want that building. I'm not going to sell it to you. And I said, well, I'm offering you the asking price here, and 
no, no, we're just going to tear it down. Oh. And uh, I lost another one. There's some dead bodies in that one. <laughs> I lost another one in a similar way, the Jocelyn Manufacturing Plant on 37th Street, which was uh, uh, another case where they were considering selling it to me. And uh, they decided that they were worried about future environmental liability for themselves because they're a giant corporation. And even though the environmental liability would transfer to the new ownership, I'm not a giant corporation. If somebody wants to sue somebody, they're going to sue whoever made the mess in the first place. And so for that reason, they just tore it down instead of selling it to me again. I was offering what they were asking. So. Barbara Maguire? Yeah, where did you get money to buy all this stuff to begin with? That's, a, that's an excellent question. So the financing behind all of this is, is very much seat of the pants and, and very small uh, and almost nothing, really, honestly. So uh, in 1997, I bought a two-flat in Logan Square for $190,000. It was completely derelict with the ceiling collapsing and graffiti on the walls, and it was a destroyed building, right? That's where I live. And, and it... Um, uh, it appreciated, and I was able to get a little bit of equity out of that. So I used that equity in the first project. Uh, you know, maybe it was $100,000 or something like that in equity. I used that. I was working full-time. My wife, Julie, is the director of policy at the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless, and so she has a nonprofit salary, so we use that. Uh, and um, don't get deep into debt. You know, you only do what you can afford to do, and it's it's very difficult. So the first building took maybe six years to renovate. It took a long time, but there was no debt. And to this day, I don't owe anything on it. That the building makes money, and um, and it was done for almost no money. So with tons of waste stream material. So now this one. Um, I actually have a family loan. The five hundred thousand dollars was a, a family loan. Uh, I, I actually managed to get a bank loan, which is very difficult to do because no bank will lend you money to buy a derelict building. They say, well, show us the leases. Is it finished yet? Then we'll give you the money. Well, that's, that's supposed to work. So, uh, so on the on the current one, I managed to convince uh, Banco Popular to give me uh, a loan based on the value of bubbly dynamics of the first building. Uh, which is valued at something like one one point two million dollars or something like that. Now, which is pretty good considering it was a derelict hulk. Um, so borrowing against that is is, is a way to, to, to get some more money. Um, the digester and the combined heat and power system are being paid for by a grant from the state of Illinois. Some of it is stimulus funding that was still hanging around. Some of it is F scrap or food scrap composting money because they looked at what we were doing and they said, this is something good, we will give you money. And they are doing that. Um, but that has nothing to do with the building and the project. That's just on the energy side. And that isn't the whole energy side. That's only about 2 thirds of it. So we're still trying to scrape together the rest of it. Um, so again, we've got tons of recycled materials that we're using. Um, I'm running right at the edge, uh, finances wise, you know, so my wife and I have liquidated whatever we have to the point where we're, you know, we're just kind of barely scraping along the bottom here. But we have tenants moving in and we have trucks parked in the yard and we have enough income that we're just getting ready to crest over the, the break-even point right now. So once you're at break-even, then it's, you know, unless something horrible happens, which it certainly can, uh, we're pretty good at this point. Okay, Dennis Nelson, uh, great presentation. Uh, what's the R factor of the new windows that you're installing? They're about seven, R7. Uh, I could have gone a little bit higher, but uh, we wanted more solar gain, solar heat gain. And so had we gone with a, a stronger or thicker low E coatings, we could have had a higher R value, but we would have gotten less solar gain. And this being Chicago, we like to have a little bit of solar gain too. Have you considered solar photovoltaics or due to your finances, that's something that you're Yes, we have, but they're not efficient enough. Okay. Because you, can, you might as well just put a greenhouse and grow with the other 80% of the light that you're throwing away if you get solar panels. And so we needed, we went with the digester because you get more bang for the buck essentially because we need it. Well, this turbine is 500 kilowatts, right? We need about 300 kilowatts to run the building. And you got the waste right there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I'm sorry, I forgot. Oh, Phil. Phil. 
Uh, the, the project you have is, it's pretty elaborate. I was just wondering, what, what is like the sort of underlying driving theme to the, to the project? Like, what, what is it that you wanted to accomplish or to show or to demonstrate or, um, do, do, you know, with, with all this elaborate, very intricate uh, greenhouse project? Well, uh, I guess I wanted to hit a lot of different subjects. First off, I wanted to hit industrial reuse and say these structures have so much embodied energy in them, they have a tremendous amount of value in the concrete you know, the hundred-year-old concrete and the steel. And so that was something that I wanted to prove. Uh, I wanted to prove that there's value in multi-story industrial activities instead of just greenfield, you know, where you build one-story vast things out in cornfields everywhere. I wanted to prove that urban density, which is a very important concept, uh, uh, makes sense and can be done in an efficient way. Uh, and I wanted to... Um, uh, I want to go to work every day in a building that's full of food. All right. So there's a lot of different areas in the city that don't have supermarkets, and they don't have even uh, 7-Elevens or things that have nature. Yeah. And there's probably a lot of uh, factories in those areas. And are you trying to get people to develop that in those areas? Uh, we are indirectly. I mean, we are by setting an example and saying uh, that this does work. And so food deserts is the, is the term for that. And um, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're keenly interested in and, and, and trying to get better quality food out into the community. But we're also trying to do that not by encouraging people necessarily to grow it in giant factories, but to uh, by demonstrating uh, urban agriculture on a small scale outside in our yard so we have raised beds outside uh, that people just randomly wandering down the street can see they can see food growing and hopefully by seeing that uh, here in this you know industrial wasteland it'll occur to them gee you know maybe I should plant a garden and we'll, we're teaching people how to do that too so uh, you know more food the better Will the building have what I call an essential piece for every office park, and that is a bar? <laughs> yes. <laughs> got a brewery. They, yeah, the brewery uh, has a tasting room associated with it that will be a, uh, a place where you can come and, and buy beer, you can take a tour. It's going to morph uh, after a few years into a cafe where you can come and eat foods that have been made in the building mostly. We're also planning on doing a little retail space that's part of the brewery. All breweries these days have to have retail because they make a lot of money selling t-shirts and mugs and beer and all that sort of thing. And so we're planning on including uh, croissants and other things made uh, made on site in that in that retail thing. Since so. since you're located on the south side, will people from the north side, particularly near Wrigleyville, be welcome? Uh, oh. Welcome, not necessarily, but they will come. <laughs> they'll take your money. If you, you, money. If, if you look at uh, Three Floyds, for instance, in, in Munster, right? Uh, they're in the middle of an industrial park in Illinois, and people in droves come from Chicago to go eat at the, at the bar there. And, uh, and so I think we're actually in a fine spot. Bravo. Okay. So I have two questions, and I think they're related to each other. Uh, <coughs> I want to go back to the question of the roof. You said, actually, maybe it's three questions. But anyway, you said that the roof could collapse. Now, is that in general when you put when you start growing things of it or on it, or is it because this roof has problems to begin with? No, that's in general because uh, the loadings that uh, by the time you start putting a bunch of saturated material up there. Uh, you start to, to hit pretty high floor loadings pretty quickly. And there are different definitions. There's inaccessible versus accessible green roofs. And uh, accessible assumes that you're going to have giant parties with a thousand people jumping up and down on your roof. Um, and, and so the standards are higher with exiting and, and, and whatnot. Uh, in our case, I think we had to hit 125 pounds per square foot, which doesn't sound like much, but that is actually a lot of load uh, on the roof. Um, 
the, the plant had good solid concrete roofs, so we have no, no worries there. It's a newer building than Bubbly. Bubbly was built in 1910 in the first year of poured concrete construction. Uh, and it was built, built very poorly, and the concept changed very quickly after they built it. Yeah. And uh, so it was a little bit more borderline, but, uh, but still totally fine. So uh, am I correct in, in understanding that the picture of your daughter was a way to lay out the uh, the planting in such a way that it wouldn't make the roof collapse? No, it had nothing to do with that. It was just a fun way to lay out the plant. Uh, and so the, the roof is plenty strong. <laughs> um, I have two questions. Um, the first is, are you aware of any similar effort in Detroit? or is? Uh, no, there, there are a lot of urban agriculture efforts going on in Detroit. None of them are like this. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping to see, and I think a lot of people are hoping to see, an urban ag renaissance in Detroit because it's a kind of a sensible thing to do in a city like that. Uh, I do know somebody there who is interested in turning the former Michigan Central train station into a vertical farm. It is a fabulous idea, but it's also such a high profile thing that I'm afraid he's going to be up against some tremendous no dollar numbers to get it done. But uh, as soon as he uh, says he's ready to go, I'm going to get on the train and go over there. And, uh, <laughs> um, the second question I have, and this is very far-fetched, but I have to ask about apiaries. Um, do, do you have any plans in your future to do any beekeeping? <laughs> oh, we're doing beekeeping right now. Uh, at, at Bubbly, we have hives, and this summer at the plant, we'll have several hives, too. And, uh, you know, for those of the you those of you, you that don't know, sorry, uh, local honey and the local er the better is so good for you, uh, and uh, um, and so you know you really want it to be uh, you want the bees to live right where you live, and it's, it's a very healthy thing. And so bees are a big important part of it. We hope to have livestock at some point also, uh, whether it's goats or or something. Uh, at this point, the city is not interested in that, and so, um, yeah, um, that's a whole other discussion about the city, but anyway. <laughs> Actually, let, let, me just, I, let, me, let me just say, uh, Mayor Emanuel has been tremendously supportive, and, uh, and all of the various commissioners have been absolutely great. And, are you, are you using the European honeybee or, or a hybrid? I don't know. Okay, I have two. I have two more questions, and that is, um, could you tell us more about the digester? It sounds like a high pressure, very high temp thing. That sounds like it would just blow the minds of the building department. How did you get this stuff through there? Any any pointers? Well, uh, luckily, digesters have been around long <laughs> enough and have a pretty flawless safety record, and. Um, it is. At a, it, they operate at very low pressures. Yeah. If it exploded, it would be just like a giant fart. Essentially. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, it, it would. Bad. They kill sometimes. Yeah. But um, it's, uh, it's not. Um, it's not very high pressure. So uh, the city specifically allowed it, partly for us because we were we were harping on the subject. About a year ago, there was an, an ordinance that specifically allowed anaerobic digestion and opened up composting in general in the city and allowed you to do larger scale composting. The, the new urban agriculture ag, uh, ordinance passed a couple months ago, which specifically allows aquaponics and um, I can't remember what else, but some other things that were directly related to what we're doing, and now we're not illegal anymore, which is nice. Uh, so, although, uh, although as an aside, people in the zoning department were, you know, giving me letters saying you're not allowed to do that, but on the side they were saying we want you to do it, do it. We want you to do this. Money. Okay. So. Anyway. Yes. Hi, uh, have you ever considered scaling down this the urban agriculture net zero kind of system to something that's mobile, maybe fits inside of a shipping container? Um, I haven't. I haven't specifically, but there are there are other people who are kind of thinking about about some similar things, and uh, honestly, it works. All of these concepts work on many different scales, and uh, you know you can build. I've seen window, uh, window box size aquaponic systems with fish in them, uh, and so um, 
digesters also, we've built our own little five gallon bucket digesters that work just fine uh, as tests. And so uh, these concepts work pretty much on any scale. Uh, you have that yeah. Do uh, you know uh, what's going on with the Wrigley Chili factory? I would like to know. I think it's 30 acres, and um, I don't know how many millions of square feet. It's a giant facility, and I, I go by it almost every day. Where's that? 35th and, and Ashland, yeah. And it's a, a Wrigley chewing gum factory, and uh, it's another one that, uh, that someday, it's been vacant for a long time, and very well kept. So I think they're trying to get a lot of money for it. I think they were hoping that the Olympic Village would go there for a while. Trying to get your didn't work. Okay. If you're going to have livestock on site, would you aspire to a system at the moment, too? Yes. No! 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 Yeah. Um, we, uh, uh, oddly enough, we just we just sought out and got a, uh, a zoning change to M3, which is heavy industrial, from M2, which is what we were before. And even though on the property there were slaughterhouses in the past, a couple of them, uh, we were told that we were not allowed to uh, process our own fish. You know, uh, we would we would have to sell the fish live, and so. Uh, in order to not have to sell the fish live and process them, we had to go to heavy industrial zoning. So I could make steel on the property, or I can cut an organic, you know, fillet an organic fish. <laughs> the, the city right now, I think they, they have sort of an unofficial limit of about five or six chickens you can have, and that's about it. Yeah. So, I mean, someday we'd like to have more, but, yeah, it should be, it should be. Um, as, as a corollary to this, I think you were on WBEZ a while back, correct? Yeah. And what, are you planning on doing another building or, or a, another, another building after this project's done? Um, don't tell my wife. <laughs> um, it is on camera. Probably. Um, but just because, you know, idle hands, I, I, can't, I can't sit still. So um, the chances are very good that, that we'll, we'll push on to another one. Yes. Uh, yes, you're following up. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Any, anywhere where there are lower priced solid industrial buildings uh, would be great. But they need to be concrete floor. You can't really do it in a mill building, in a timber frame building, because of the humidity issues. John Casey? Yes, this, this kind of piggybacks off the question about your next project. I mean, you mentioned during your talk that um, you were working full-time as a set designer while working on that first project. I was curious how you got interested in the kind of work that you're doing with these buildings. I mean, what was it that spurred your your interest to do this kind of work? Uh, I'm a big history buff, industrial history buff. Okay. And uh, and so, to me, trying to find ways to preserve little pieces of it here and there is a driving force. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of other good things too, but yeah. that that's kind of where it came from. And actually, honestly, the reason I bought the first building was for the railroad siding because it was always my intention to restore a Pullman car, <laughs> <laughs> and still is eventually. And uh, and so I found a building that almost had a siding, and actually I worked with Norfolk Southern to have it reconnected. We had to cross 37th Street again, and we did all the engineering, I should say Norfolk Southern did all the engineering, people came up from Atlanta and St. Louis, did all these drawings, and then at the last minute somebody uh, in middle management said, nope, not reopening the grade crossing, too much liability, um. and that was that. And so I found a drywall distributor tenant who, uh, who wanted to use the siding to unload about five uh, bulkhead flat cars a week, uh, which was going to pay for, he was going to pay for everything. So, uh, but that fell through. Yes, Rhonda? Uh, tell us again what happened with the first building. You've sold it, you've still got it going. No, no, it's going, it's going. That's, that's where all my income comes from. <laughs> so what do you do over there? I change light bulbs periodically. <laughs> That's well, about it. What did you do in the first building? What do I do? What, how, what, that was what the first part of the he presentation was about. 
He renovated it. He renovated it. it. The, the columns. Yeah, because it was started. completely derelict. It was a bombed out shell with no roof. And, and it became what? Now it's the Chicago Sustainable Manufacturing Center. It's a green business incubator. Ah, that's part of this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's about 35 full time permanent jobs in that building. Cool. Are there any buildings that would be unsuitable for you just because, say, they were involved uh, in operations that had toxic chemicals? That Potentially, yes. That's Potentially, yes. And that's a, that's a big problem with derelict industrial buildings in a lot of cases. Although, uh, if it's lead based paint, for instance, there's ways to remediate all of that. If there's asbestos, there's very little asbestos left in a lot of buildings. It was removed in the previous crisis of doing that. Uh, and so this particular building was very, very clean because it was a meat packing plant. They already got rid of all of that stuff a long time ago. Um, even still, if you have to do some remediation, the embodied energy in the structure is often well worthwhile doing that. You mentioned the, excuse me, your personal financing of how this thing took place. Suppose I were to try to put together a business plan to replicate what you've done. What are the significant amounts of money that... How much money initially? Uh, I, I think I spent in total about five hundred thousand dollars on the first building. I mean, I mean that latter one, that the, the vertical farm. How much it's going to cost yeah. in, in total? Um, probably about three million for the building itself, and another, uh, well, probably about I'm sorry, two and a half million for the building itself, and the energy side, the digester and the CHP system is going to come in around. 2.7 million, I believe. And then, what would the revenue then from the building after it's fully developed be? Um, our projections keep changing, so pardon me for not having it off the top of my head. Um, Just a, a guess. It's uh, it's not you know, it, it's a lot of it is nonprofit. So if everything was leased out, it's hard to say with the farm space, you know, because we don't really know. We don't have the metrics yet on how much money the farms make because we're just starting this process and you know, we're running them, but um, they're not making any money for sure right now, but they may, you know, they probably will. We just have to get to that point. So, um, you know, it's, it's going to make a tidy amount of money. It'll make a fine return. Uh, so I, I just don't have any idea what it's going to be. And that's actually how I like it. Dorothy? Okay, I'm back here. Okay. A few years back, Mayor Daly had a program where you could do, if you did three roofs in one block, flat roofs, and you did with plants and whatever, the city would help finance it. Well, it didn't go over well because, yeah, I want to do it, but there's the education as to how to do it. And I live in a an older neighborhood with a lot of concrete buildings on concrete slabs. Mm -hmm. So where would you get that kind of, do you have that kind of information and training? I don't. Um, the Center for Green Technology, which is a city project, uh, there's quite a bit available. There's more and more out there. I mean, there are tons of consultants, too, who will charge you a lot of money, but um, it's pretty closely guarded, actually, information. It took me a lot of effort to do the, the green roof. Uh, luckily, I have a friend who's a stormwater engineer who um, worked on the recipe for the growing media for me and told me how many inches of what I needed where, and um, because I could not find that information. And it varies by, by region greatly in what you're growing, and there's all these variables, so it isn't really just something you can't just plunk it down, although I agree there needs to be a, if you're in Chicago and you're doing a small green roof, this is the best way to do it. There, that information should be easily available. Um, I don't know the correct answers. I mean, I'd love to have that information on our website too, just to help people with it, but I don't know what the answers are. But uh, that's something that would be worth poking the city about a little bit more. So, one back here. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Can I go on? What's your candid opinion of Back Red Business? Have <laughs> what? Candid opinion of ag right business. <laughs> what is that? Get into that. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Yeah, let's just so say dim. Oh, all right. Yeah. Uh, sitting next to George. <laughs> yes, George. All right. Um, one question with respect to your hydroponics. 
you've got essentially food plants growing. Therefore, structural integrity is relatively weak on most of those. How do you anchor the plants? Uh, right now, mostly we're growing greens, right? So um, the greens are in, in net pots sitting in foam uh, rafts. Uh, we're, we built aquaponic raft systems mostly, although we're starting to do some thin film ones where there isn't a, a right. big puddle of water underneath them. Uh, but basically, the, there's a pot, a little plastic pot with, it's mostly open, it's in that, uh, that has uh, hydroton or some other uh, inert growing media in it, and then a little piece of rock wool, which is mineral fiber, which is blast furnace slag, uh, that you put the seeds in. And then the, the roots just grow down into the water. Uh, in, in thin film, so we're starting to build some vertical systems now. Uh, there's just a little tiny layer of water running down kind of the back and the roots barely touch it and it's mo the roots are mostly in air. So there are, there are a lot of different ways to do it and um, you know I, I, I admit we actually have quite a few former pot growers on staff. <laughs> who, uh, you know, we're, 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 we want to grow plants inside, who are you going to ask, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you think you'll ever get into that as a sideline business? Question. The question, therefore, is you don't you don't have a solid matrix of any sort that, that the the roots are wrapping themselves around. You can no. pull them up easily. Yeah, that's important. Thank you. Okay. You may have said this. Did you, did you say what fuel you're using for the uh, for the next nine months, we're going to be using natural gas, and then as the digester comes online, it will be biogas. If the, if the digester gets ill or something like that, then we can blend seamlessly back and forth between natural gas. Or if we have a peak load that we can't handle with the biogas, we'll blend in natural gas. I, I was curious, do you have any commitments uh, from local businesses to purchase the produce? We have way more offers to purchase than we have produce. Really? Tons. Yeah. That's great. Everybody wants local. Local is the new organic, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and that's great because you want to create the jobs doing it right where it is and you want to eliminate transportation and the energy consumed in the transportation of it. So it's a really good thing. Nice. David? <coughs> Would it be feasible in your, in your plant to grow either uh, coffee or cacao plants? Probably not. <laughs> Uh, we haven't looked too closely at it, but generally speaking, in a vertical farm, you want to grow higher value, shorter shelf life plants, uh, and um, it's the economics of it, basically. But uh, something that needs to be on the dinner table tonight, you know, that's the that's the best the best thing to do when you're doing it in an energy intensive way in a building. Yes, we would, and I, we're not we're not really planning on going that direction at all. No. Uh, One more. Oh, I think this gets. You had. I was surprised to hear that the digester was cost was in the millions of dollars. Yeah. Um, you have an idea of what? I know the gas is essentially free that you're powering your <coughs> with, but. With the financing that high for the digester, and the, what does it cost per kilowatt, or how many kilowatt hours? Do you, when's the payback? Okay, we're actually, believe it or not, going to be making money, making our own energy, because we're getting paid to take the waste. We're getting paid for the waste product at the back end of the digester, and it's not much money, but it's in the positive, and. And, by the way, we get all our energy for free on top of that. So, in a big building, in a big farm building, you can burn through uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars in energy and nothing flat. And so, um, the payback is pretty fast, actually. Is you know, that because in, in, the financing was free for that? Yeah. Uh, 
a lot of the companies that we've talked to about digesters, you know, were, were giving, you know, showing us their spreadsheets that even without government assistance, it still makes a lot of sense and pays back in a reasonable amount of time, like eight years or something like that. So um, ours, uh, ours will pay back in about two or three, I think, for what we're putting in. What is it? How much is the state giving you? How much are you putting in? State's today? giving us 1.5 or 1.6, somewhere in there. And uh, I'm putting in uh, about 540,000, I think. And then um, another part of the state is talking about giving us some more money. And then there's some 1603 tax credits you can get at the back end, uh, which might contribute yet another half a million. Or what do you so. mean another part of the state? <laughs> Well, DCEO, Department of Community and Economic Opportunity, there are many, many programs and many ways to get assistance from many different departments and people. And uh, projects, uh, alternative energy projects, it's actually pretty easy to get uh, state or federal money for. So when's the IPO? <laughs> no way, man. We Actually, I don't take investors uh, because Investors have this bad habit of wanting their money back mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and saying, how come you haven't leased all these spaces up? And so, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. I like to do this as a research project. I like to do it because it's fun. Uh, there's a lot of reasons I like to do it, and I'm not really interested, you know, in the bottom line of it, which, you know, makes me a terrible business person, but um, if it's not fun, I'm not going to do it. So, uh, and, you know, then it doesn't... Part of, part of also what we're trying to prove is that for no money you can do this because I'd like to see other grassroots organizations and whatnot you know so okay we're we're um, forging ahead with this and we're coming up with the ideas and doing the research and, and, and whatnot and if we make that available it'll be a lot easier and every time somebody does it it'll get easier. Okay. But it is not for no money. You just said uh, not for no money no but you know. Well, if you can get the financing it pays for itself. Right, but it's small money compared to, uh, you know, 150, 200, 800 dollars a square foot kind of costs that other people are talking about, and it's very, very small money. So you know, we're talking maybe 20 dollars a square foot when it's done. <coughs> uh, forgot your name already. Uh, what do the tilapia eat? Right now, they eat commercial uh, tilapia chow. Can you close that? Yes, but uh, the problem is that actually commercial tilapia food is so well engineered, it's very, very hard to grow your own or provide your own food that gets anywhere near the weight gain and the things that the fish need. We are planning on blending slowly in uh, algae, duckweed, uh, distillers grains like uh, spent barley, for instance, is a, great, uh, is a great tilapia feed. Tilapia eat just about anything. Uh, we, we would like to start blending in worms that we're raising, because we are raising worms at the plant too, worm and composting. Uh, and the other actually brings up a good point, because farm-raised fish is very low in omega-3s. Very, very low, like none. And so, um, if you can find a way to get omega-3s into the diet of farm-raised fish, then all of a sudden the fish will have some It's value. already been done, John. Well, there's a way... It's what, already been done. Well, what we're, the way we're planning on doing it is by raising algae to fix the omega-3s, feeding the algae to worms and grubs and things like that, and then feeding, because then it gets into the fatty tissues, and then feeding that, those worms, to the fish in order to get the omega-3s in there. Which algae? Uh, sidebar. <laughs> <laughs> Are we running out of questions? Yes, no, let's no, go. No, no, we've got more. Okay, great. Um, they have, uh, what are you doing with the micro, uh, my, uh, mycology? What are you, so you're eating up the oil on the floor, yeah, but it, uh, are you going to be growing it in a big way there? Yeah, we're, we're right now we're building out a lion's mane room and an oyster mushroom room, um, growing them in different ways uh, with intent to sell. And... Um, that's uh, it's slowly coming online, and um, you know, it, it, mushrooms can be a very profitable thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. it's a mushrooming business. Yes. Uh, about yes. how long do you think it's going to be? It's going to take to finish this plant building? When it's done, it's one of those things where I don't understand. And the parts of it have gone way faster than I expected. Other parts are—I uh, can't believe we still haven't even started. 
Uh, so, you know, it's, it's probably going to be substantially occupied in about, four, in about three, four years. It, the leasing up is going faster than I expected because there's lots of people that want to get in. So, but we'll be working on it for years. Okay. Yeah, speaking of uh, intensive cell, do you ever plan dealing with magic mushrooms? <laughs> Probably not. Um, okay. Uh, you know that there, there are lots of ways to make money. Yeah. Um, that's one of them. Most important question tonight: Cubs or Sox fan? Uh -huh. I don't follow football. That's the best rebuttal you've ever got, buddy. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> So we give tours on, on Saturdays and Thursdays at 2 o'clock. We ask for a $10 suggested donation, which we use to feed our volunteers, uh, and we feed them quite well. Give us your website and phone number one more time loud. 1400 West 46th Street. Uh, if you go to plantchicago.org, that's our website. You can learn all about it there, plantchicago.org. Uh, and, uh, and there's information about the tours also there. But 2 o'clock on uh, Thursdays and Saturdays, just show up. No reservations. And, um, right. Thank you. We are now moving to our infamous rebuttal period in which you are invited to address the strong here uh, with whatever information, questions, or uh, diatribes you may concoct. Uh, the question, however, is how many of you are going to speak so we can afford the time? How many? One, two, Go about from about four, four to five minutes. Forty-five minutes each. Yeah. About four minutes each. Some of you may be persuaded uh, later to uh, uh, answer or respond to. Uh, the uh, remarks being made by our uh, infamous crew. Yes, uh, your fellow audience. Yeah. Motley crew? No, infamous is better, dude. Without any further ado, then, uh, for five minutes and no more, uh, but perhaps less, I give you uh, our first speaker, Joe Mayer. Vegetarians of Chicago area unite! Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the very far southwest side of Chicago, actually on the edge of the southwest side of Chicago, there is one of the uh, the best high schools in the country. It's called the Chicago High School for Agricultural Science. 95% or more of the students graduate from that school, and all of those graduates are offered jobs as they leave the school. They're recruited beforehand. And I wondered whether our speaker and his group have ever uh, encountered the Chicago High School for Agricultural Science. Perhaps you'll answer that question. In my misspent youth, uh, not youth, in my misspent midlife, uh, I owned a theater uh, on the southwest, on the north side, called Cross Currents Cabaret Theater. It was on uh, Belmont, just uh, just north of Belmont on Wilton Street, where the uh, L, L train is now. It's gone. They made a parking lot out of it. The Dallas met in there, you know. Yes. Yes. yes we met there. Um, I, made, I made a... Uh, uh, a proposal to the city of Chicago at one time. Uh, it, it used to be, it, uh, what, the, play, the building we bought was called the uh, 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 
Swedish Temperance Cafe Idrot. Uh, we, tur we, we turned it into a cabaret theater. Uh, but uh, there was a kitchen at one time in one part of it, and it had stainless steel, seven by four foot uh, polished stainless steel uh, panels on the kitchen wall. And uh, I decided that it would be a very good idea uh, to bend the uh, stainless steel panels into uh, roughly cylindrical shapes and mount them on a track on the roof so that it would pick up the sun in the east and follow it to the west and it would automatically follow the sun over the seasons, clicking up and down. And uh, we would then use the garbage from the neighborhood, uh, from the many restaurants which were there. Uh, the, the light from the sun would be focused on a central reactor, uh, which would then ferment the uh, uh, garbage and uh, produce alcohol, actually. And, yay! Uh, yay! The city of Chicago thought it was a great idea. They actually uh, came out, looked at the place. The roof was flat, so it was great. Um, and we began the project. However, uh, someone in the Department of Revenue of the city of Chicago said, what do you have? You're going to use the alcohol for the uh, boiler in the, in the basement to heat the place, right? Correct? But don't you sell alcohol as well? Yes, we do. That was the end of the project. We totally. could not produce alcohol uh, to, to, to run the boiler because it was uh, not producing revenue. And we might use the alcohol to sell. You never know. You just didn't bribe them enough. You have to find the right price. I want to mention that I have the pleasure to have visited the plant, and I was uh, very, very highly impressed by, by what I saw, and uh, some of the uh, areas were totally a mess, but as we saw here, they have been able to uh, clean them up and everything, and at the time, they were talking about having a machine shop in the place, and since I, I am a designer and I work in the machines and all that, I was really uh, thinking at the time to, to go and volunteer to help them to do whatever it needed to be done. So maybe I will, uh, I will rethink that and, and eventually do it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to go next because uh, my friend Andy Anderson is still working on his rebuttal. It's a terrific presentation. I'm going to have to take a tour some Saturday. Uh, my name is Dennis Nelson. I'm the board president of the Nuclear Energy Information Service, NEIS, uh, Illinois Nuclear Power Watchdog Group, located in the uh, Logan Square neighborhood here in Chicago. Uh, Plant Chicago isn't, isn't exactly the sort of thing that we advocate as a part of our carbon-free, nuclear-free energy pathway. Dr. Arjun Makajani is a physicist and engineer from the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research in Tacoma Park, Maryland. He's crunched the numbers and shown that within 30 to 50 years, we can have a 100% renewable energy economy and get off of all oil, coal, and nuclear. Plant Chicago as a vertical farm is an excellent example of a new paradigm to our local urban agriculture. I mean, I grew up in Iowa, which is an agricultural state. And traditional agriculture in rural areas is more spread out, obviously. You could say that it's horizontal. Go out to Kane County, McHenry County, and see farms, of course. Um, vertical farms take into account the more dense compactness of cities like here in Chicago. Um, Plant Chicago is important for growing local healthier food, creating green-collar jobs, reducing our greenhouse gases, and going net zero energy, the sort of thing that Arjun talks about in carbon-free, nuclear-free. This is when your uh, building produces as much energy from renewable sources as it uh, consumes. It was reported this past week that millions of dollars have been allocated to make over a Navy Pier. Some of you may have seen that on the news. There are pictures in Red Eye, which is the free daily put out by the Chicago Tribune that showed some proposals by architectural firms that shared no expense. They were very creative and everything. No, nothing against Navy Pier in itself. I've done bird watching there. It's a great place to walk around and enjoy a nice Saturday or Sunday afternoon. You mean chick watching. 
Oh, that too. There's bird watching and there's bird watching. And I suppose that, you know, it's, a, you know, it's both actually, uh, depending upon the depending upon the time of day that you go. Um, but uh, Davey Pear is getting this attention because it's such a, a big tourist attraction. If Mayor Rahm Emanuel really wants Chicago to be the number one green city in the nation, then our priorities have to change. The millions of dollars advocated to the Navy Pier makeover should go instead to putting vertical farms like Plant Chicago in economically distressed areas on the west and south sides, which are also food deserts, and that was also mentioned tonight, it's been reported in the media, areas where the people don't have uh, act readily access to produce fresh fruits and vegetables, but you do have access to fast foods. Thank you very much. That was good. Hello. It's nice to see uh, a whole bunch of new faces here that we haven't seen in a long time. Uh, could I have a show of hands? Uh, how many people came here uh, as an advertisement for the College of Complexes uh, versus uh, how many people came because they knew the speaker himself? Are a lot of people here uh, to hear a presentation on uh, green farming and green buildings? So I'm assuming uh, that you all have other interests toward moving toward a green future. Is, is that fair to say? Uh, I would like to say that uh, in the last five years, uh, to all the talks I've heard here, this is one of the very best, uh, one of the handful of uh, the very best talks that I've ever heard at this place. And uh, how many people here are familiar with the work of Amory Lawrence over the last 30 years or so? The, uh, he's, the, the, you, you are. Yeah. For Amory Lovins and other people like him uh, from Rocky Mountain Institute have been publishing and writing work on uh, energy efficiency, resource materials efficiency, what could be done with so the so-called least cost strategy, like essentially uh, reusing old buildings, reusing old materials, all kinds of things. Uh, it's, it, there's a global revolution of this kind of stuff going on that we don't see in the Chicago press or the American press. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm, I'm L.P. Anderson, Andy Anderson. Uh, my brother and I run something called the Northwest Information Service out in Palatine. We translate databases of information into one-page cliff notes that somebody can read in five minutes. We specialize in subjects that are blacked out by the mainstream media in America. And what we heard here tonight this concept of moving in a green direction, that's not covered by the media in America like it is around the world. If this kind of knowledge were widespread, we could bring the troops home from everywhere and spend that money in America, uh, be completely clear of foreign oil uh, virtually overnight, and develop, we'd have universal health care for everybody with a fraction of the money that's being wasted right now. Uh, you know, if, the, if the concept of what our speaker talked about tonight were uh, spread throughout our society dealing with other problems, it would be a, a transformation in a decade, much like what we had to put a man on the moon or the Manhattan Project. And uh, next week I will be giving a talk that revolves around this kind of revolution in thinking on four or five different uh, fronts, addressing uh, the problems of the military, the educational industrial complex in America that's running a total scam on our young people, the pharmaceutical complex that is also running a multi-hundred billion dollar scam on Americans, uh, what it would be like if, if we had, we're, next week we're going to talk about solutions and uh, we're going to talk about the concept of what America would look like if we had uh, what Amory called a sudden cessa cessation of stupidity. <laughs> he, he credited that phrase to Edwin Land, uh, the inventor of uh, the Polaroid camera, uh, back way back. But that, that phrase came out of a book in 1980, uh, Explore With Us, you know, uh, Energy and War, Breaking the Nuclear Link. What would be possible in the energy efficiency field if we had a sudden cessation of stupidity? I'll, next week, uh, for those of you that come next week, will you get a reprint 
out of 1997, 15 years ago, we pulled one out of the archives. This blue flyer is uh, the top 10 blacked out subjects of 1997, 15 years ago. Most of them are still being blacked out, but one of them on the list here, the houses without furnaces, $10 a month heating bills. That one is beginning to get a little bit of coverage in the Chicago area. The, the 100 mile per gallon cars they've been testing since 1980, 32 years ago. Uh, we will be talking about these things and uh, what's happening around the world. The Germans uh, are leading the way in energy efficiency along with some of the others. But um, we'll give you a, a list of historical dates, like the houses in Schaumburg with no furnace and heat for 10 bucks a month. Hundred dollars a year max. They've been building these houses in the western suburbs, ordinary things, for the last 32 years that we know of. So there, there's a bunch of really, really good things, just like what you talked about tonight. Brilliant, brilliant presentation. A summary of you know trying to cram 50 pounds worth of potatoes into a 20 pound sack. <laughs> and you always think, well, what did I forget to say? I, I, I would love to hear another presentation uh, if you're going to give one someday soon. Let us know because uh, this knowledge would uh, spread and help a lot of people. So uh, all of those of you interested in a green future, come next week and uh, get a, an expanded view on a variety of uh, different fronts of how we can move forward. Thank you. Yeah, it was a very interesting speech. I'm interested not only for what he said, but the potential for other things, and that is potential of breaking away from the corporate uh, structure that we have in the United States and then controlling all the wealth. If we could break away on one thing, we could break away on another. For instance, right now, if you look at different countries, like in Argentina, for instance, the workers have taken over a lot of the factories and are running it themselves, not for profits, for the wealthy, or the owners, but just to distribute the profits to themselves. So they're not uh, exploiting one another. Spain also has that type of thing going on. And in other countries, we have some of that going on. Not only in uh, taking over factories, but banks, and having banks in neighborhoods uh, saving your money and giving you money when you, want, when, you, when you have a need for it. And that way you can break away from the real big banks, like Citibank and uh, Bank of America and the rest of them. And in a way, we could break away from capitalism itself. Sure. And it's beginning to happen. In, in a very short, or uh, not, not the extent that people notice it, especially in the United States, because we do have a censored press. Cool. Who owns the press? It's the corporations. And so we don't get that type of information. But that's what's happening all over the world. People are not sitting still. <coughs> They're not just uh, sitting back and watching television and wasting their time and listening to idiots that you have on the, uh, in the Republican and the Democratic Party. They don't really have solutions. That's all they have is uh, these broad sayings that they keep repeating over and over again, these mantras that they keep repeating over and over and over again that don't really mean anything. Like Obama came in with the mantra of change. What does that mean? I mean, change could be anything. Somebody dies, that's change. Somebody uh, uh, may maybe uh, loses a house, that's change. So you have to have a real program with concrete solutions to it. And I think that's beginning to happen to a certain degree. This might take years. And right now, the economy seems to be getting a little better. But the economy basically is very unstable. And it's not only because of regulations. The reason is that when you allow corporations to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, 
They buy off everything in sight. I don't care what laws are put in place. They could buy off the politicians if they have all that wealth. So reforming the system, like Roosevelt did, didn't work in the long run. Huh. Why? Because he kept the same system in power that was there before. He just done what he called what they call social democracy, which was started by uh, Bismarck around 1870 or so. And, and that's, that's, that's what he done. But he didn't try to break up the corporations or anything of that nature. So this farming, I think, is a good start in that direction. Good evening, everybody. John, um, if you'll allow me a small joke, perhaps the beer that they're going to be brewing there should be called Edelweiss. Oh. <laughs> All right, now I've had enough groans. Um, I have a great many questions which I'm going to pepper you with later, but for the moment, um, I think there's one small area that John didn't cover probably because he didn't have time, and that is the integration of his system can actually be looked at as an ecology in and of itself. Uh, the key to the American economy has been since its founding, cheap energy. Well, cheap energy is not so cheap anymore. And therefore, anything that reduces the amount of energy necessary to produce all kinds of goods, um, anything that reduces that improves our probability of survival, which is what it's all about. This is not a matter of will the system crash. It's a matter of when will the system crash. And what John seems to be doing is at least hedging our bets with respect to the problem. Um, will it expand? I don't know. But anyway, the ecology is a very interesting component. He's got plants dependent upon animals, dependent upon energy, dependent upon the logistics of space, re space use, and space efficiency. And I think if you go to his website, which is plantchicago.com, you will see an awful lot of good information. If you've already done it, forgive me. If you have not, I strongly recommend that you go take a look at it. There are lots of things there that are of interest, at least to me. So looking at it again from a biological standpoint of an integrated ecology, this, in my opinion, is the way for business to travel, the way for business to grow. Otherwise, it's not going to grow, it's going to crash. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Everybody else? Yeah. Hi. I'll say a few things and thanks for a wonderful lifetime. All right, thank you very much. Um, for those of you in here who are gardeners at home, something that I learned at Chicago Energy something over on the Sacramento uh, is uh, clay pot watering. And what that is is you get a clay pot, fill the hole in, plug the hole in the bottom, take the clay pot, put it in the soil, fill that with water. It has to be a terracotta pot non-glazed. Right? The water leaches through the clay and into the soil, so you're just watering the roots. You have a six inch pot, it will hold water for three or four days, depending on the heat. So in the summertime, I just go out there like twice a week, lift the cover off, fill it, move on. It takes me like 10 minutes to water. Very nice system. Um, the other thing is, um, over in uh, Spain, you know, where I have a lot of family, uh, many, there's a group of them that make living, uh, living growing mussels, all right? And this is in the ocean, and it's salt water. And the way they do it is they, they have these um, frame structures. Um, you take lumber, like 12 by 12s, and you build a large floating mat on a grid, okay? And then they take, in the middle of each of the squares, you know, they'll drop a chain or a rope actually, and then a heavy rope. And then there's a net that goes on the outside, kind of like a coax cable, where you have a solid piece in the center and then a, like a cover on the outside. And then, this is a science to them, they take 
muscle larva and they drizzle it down and it falls down and the, the larva attach themselves to the heavy rope. All right? And then they just leave it there. And they come back and they have this thing planned out and they come back with their boats and their boats have these hooks that reach over, grab a rope and pull the rope out of the ocean, 40 feet of rope. All right? And on the 40 feet of rope, it's just full of muscles, like 12 inches of muscles. And they put that on the rope, and they take it to the factory, which is nearby. And, you know, the factory processes it, and you know, like, everybody's happy. Right? People make a lot of money that way. The best joke I ever heard, one of the best, Saturday Night Live, after the Soviet Union fell, and the guy who was doing the news looked straight in the camera and said, who knew? Who knew that the Soviet Union would fall? No. Who knew that communism would fall because there was no money in it? <laughs> and our speaker tonight, there's no money in it. You know? Which is why it's going to be hard to promote. The thing about what, how we have evolved is that it's predicated on growth. And of course, nothing grows forever. So like the speaker before me said, it's destined to fail. But to get people to live a life that isn't predicated on growth is like, I mean, why would you do it? There's no money in it. Okay? So it just has to be done. But how can it be done? Like you say, sometimes you just got to do it. Um, and my last comment, well, second to last comment, is that uh, for many years, about eight years, I was a vegetarian. And I gave that up when one of the, the girls in our group gave birth to a beautiful little boy with spinal bifida. Okay? Spinal bifida is done because you don't have, the woman does not have folic acid in her system when the neural tube is forming. Right? And when that happened to her, I realized then that this ain't natural. And then later on I realized that the people who live in the Arctic, the people who live in the deserts, all of those people, as natural as can be, the people of Australia, the people of the Sahara, the people of the Arctic, none of them can be vegetarians. They just don't have the growing season. And then I realized that it's a, it's a luxury. It's not natural. It's a luxury. Now, the last thing is that those of you who are new to the college and have stayed this long, congratulations. This, for me, is the best part. And uh, pick up a schedule. It's kind of like this, you know, often. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Okay, um, human beings are adaptive omnivores. Um, they're, the people in the Arctic uh, eat um, sea life and the blubber and everything because that's where they are. They develop some internal chemistries that kind of are, um, are based on that. Uh, but we do have DNA that's adaptive. Are, we are adaptive omnivores, so you should look that up, okay? There, and by the way, that woman having that um, baby that had this spina bifida was probably not due to anything that you particularly ate, unless, were you the father? <laughs> Just have to ask that. <laughs> what was that? No, it's okay. That's what she did. It was what she, what was she did. Yeah, not exactly. Eat. She she did not she did not take a folic acid. The um, uh, vegetarians that are in the know understand that they have to have a, uh, the full complement of all of the vitamins, and you can get that in a vegetarian. If you're diet. talking to me. My response to you is primitive people are not in that know. Some There's primitive people were vegetarians. I want you to know that it totally depended on the climate that they were in. But not if they live in the desert, not if they live in the Arctic. You're right, and last time I checked, we're not in a desert, and we're not in the Arctic. But thank you. So, okay, um, number two, and that is um, 
that. Okay, I want to learn. Uh, I want to hear a lot more about the anaerobic digester. Uh, digester. It seems like um, okay. So yeah, the anaerobic digester makes methanol, correct? Methane. Methane. Yeah, methane okay. Yeah. And so you're using that to run a turbine to create electricity. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, great. So I would like to know if you found any small turbines, because I lived in Ashland, Oregon, in Northern California, around Mount Shasta, and the um, and whole communities were getting together, like four or five families, to buy an anaerobic digester, much smaller than the one that you're talking about, to use, and you can put anything organic in this, okay? So scraps and grass and just anything can go into these anaerobic digesters. And uh, so they were making methane, and some people actually were running like refrigerators and things off methane, but it would be much easier to see if it, you could run a small turbine and make electricity out of that. So if you could give us any ideas about that, that would be great. So um, do you, uh, like four or five families were pulling their money together, buying one anaerobic digester, and using that to digest all of their organic matter, and then uh, taking it, you know, sharing the uh, methane, and then running some of their appliances thing off of this this methane. So that is one way that we as a community can come together. They also came together, and um, in buying groups. So like, let's say two blocks in an area, and there may have been maybe 10 families that were trying to go uh, put uh, PVC panels on their houses, okay, so go solar, and uh, th what they would do is they'd pull their money, and maybe one or two houses would start out, and then they would save the money that they would get from the savings, okay, and also selling back the energy that they were producing to the energy companies, and they would pull that money back into the pool, and then the next two families would go online with PV, and do you understand? They would, uh, then this is the way that I think that a lot of people could really come together and get this technology slowly but surely. So just FYI. Um, number two, Taos, um, I'm sure you looked into this when and you read about this. Taos has a huge digester, anaerobic digester. They're getting paid. So this group of people, um, you know, uh, invested in a huge digester. They are getting paid from the city of Taos to dig through their um, landfill, okay, pull out the organic matter. So they're getting a, a money stream from that um, mechanism. They're getting all of that waste, and they're collecting all of the compost and everything from the entire city. They're putting it in the digester, and then they um, have contracted with the city to sell the methane only in Taos, so keeping it very local. And they've found that to be a very money, um, you know, uh, advantageous, economically advantageous for them. So there's all sorts, do you understand, there's all sorts of ways of doing this. we got a lot of garbage that we got to sort through, you know what I mean? A lot of organic matter we got to dig up and, and use for these uh, sorts of things. And you can use some of the t this technology in a small way for, you know, you, your home, and maybe a couple neighbors. Um, the last thing I wanted to let you know is I forgot one of the announcements. We're having a global teach-in. Occupy and several uh, non-for-profit organizations in the Illinois Citizens for Public Banking are having a global teaching. This teach-in is going to be broadcast to 20 cities around the country and 20 radio shows around the country, and it includes a number of speakers on alternative economic systems. And it's going to be in April, and it will be up on our website, publicbanking.org, and one of the speakers will be Ellen Brown, who is the founder of the Public Banking Institute. So please check in on that one too, so mid-April someplace. Thank you. That was a great speech. I mean, I really enjoyed it. It was really, I mean, as far as the speeches I've heard, this one is applied to everyone's life, you know, because it's talking about food and uh, a way to be innovative, you know, with low cost. And that brings up uh, the topic that I'm interested in is uh, green energy. I was at a um, conference uh, last Saturday, and they talked about how Warren Buffett, and um, Bill Gates said that the deregulation of energy is the largest transference of wealth in this nation's history. And it uh, <clears throat> and the uh, the thing is that January 24th, Illinois became deregulated. So you can buy RECs, what are called uh, renewable energy credits. If you want to contribute to what is um, 
uh, helping, you know, to go green, then there's a way that you can do it. And at the conference, I met a number of people that were making quite a bit of money doing that type of thing. So you can get into it, and it's another way of uh, supplementing your income. If you just check into it. All right. As much as I hate to say it, folks, you've been talking a lot tonight about innovation, about low cost, about various things. That, to me, speaks of an ugly word that many of you guys call capitalism. <laughs> and uh, what you're really rallying against is something called corporatism, or as mercantilism as Adam Smith put it. To, to truly keep my theme of capitalism and capitalistic things going, I want to make you an offer tonight. Can I refuse it? Oh my god. DVDs of December 9th. The life, the universe, and everything. I'm offering for five bucks a piece. I'll throw in a little movie of from Dictatorship to Democracy with Gene Sharp. <laughs> Uh, see me afterwards, and there's our brief commercial. Thank you for your capitalistic tendencies. <laughs> uh, if you really want to get some business, why don't you do part of the lecture that I gave? I've got it, Charlie, and it'll be going soon. All right, then let's thank our speaker again. Uh, right. <laughs> I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. I hope I'm doing this right. First of all, I'm going to jump around regarding this place called Cross Currents. The college complexes met in this. Actually, we got bounced around Cross Currents, and we ended up in the basement with the boiler one time, <laughs> which didn't matter at the time. There was a lot more alcohol in the college, so I don't think it mattered at all to these guys. <laughs> But there was another incident at Cross Currents. We invited a woman from Southeast Asia to talk about the Burmese culture. And she was telling us how wonderful it was and so vastly superior to every other culture on earth. And then these guys were pretty well seasoned in the politics and so forth. And they said, you know, this is a pretty corrupt place, you know. But she got so upset with us, I remember. She even followed me and Alex, remember Alex? Down the street after it was over, yelling at us. <laughs> we couldn't get rid of it. I said, She's, we can't, she follows us like you're a block. You, know? you guys are. <laughs> Anyhow, all right, we got you out there. Let's see. Hey, I'm a put dealer, and we just got an entire collection. This is you like this of something called Mother Earth News, oh, yeah. Yeah. which was around for a number of years. I started reading it. I deal in yes. transportation issues, but the feature article of the thing I'm reading is how to power a vehicle, a car, using wood. And it's not a steam engine, but somehow you just take logs and you can go zipping up and down the street. Continuing the thing. Um, uh, Let's see here. Uh, yeah, you want to have a sustainable building, I guess, in, in a sense. Uh, it used to be that all communities were sustainable. That term has kicked around a little bit. If anyone's lived in a small town or even in rural America in the 19th century, each community produced pretty much what it, what it needed within that community. And I guess they were closed systems. Uh, the thing that changed it, being a railroad man, was in fact a railroad because yeah. you could get then commercial goods and they could be mass produced and you kind of ended up with capitalism, which Tim was. And they could not only enslave people in factories, but then they had markets across wherever the railroads went, so it changed things a little bit. Uh, regarding, also regarding your community where your building is, I'll have you know, we were looking at the transportation to and from that area. As a matter of fact, 43rd and 47th Streets came up because they've been musking with the schedules. But what we've been doing, we're going to survey each ward 
to see if and give it a score. Uh, and that area isn't too bad. It, it could be better because you have access to trains and things like that. There's a question if they're 24 hour and how often they run, uh, things like that. So oh, you, you mean mentioned like, the, you, so like transportation dead zones? Yeah, okay. yeah, we give a score. And actually, we were going to try to interest people because we said, how do we convince people that this is important? <laughs> Not simply the fact of getting, in or getting around, but I said, you know, there's one thing everybody, these guys, even any Jamaica listen to, and that's the real estate values. They would enhance the value of your real estate. Um, let's see. So we got over sustainable communities. So you want to restore a Pullman car. That's pretty cool. Why don't you sign up with our railroad? Every railroad has a business plane where the executives ride around. And that's the whole Pullman. <laughs> you gotta, I mean, we'll make you a railroad tycoon out of this. You know? <laughs> After you sell stock in your Chicago railroad. We want to make some money on it. I'm not buying it right <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, we got these vegans. All the Laura dragged me to the, what is that place? Native Foods or anything? Yep. Yep. I don't, I guess I could, maybe I can confess. I went to Native Foods once and saw the vegan food. Then I went home and I got a good nitrate laced hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, that is the food. <laughs> no, my friend Al. In Bridgeport, we, was way, we were way ahead of you. Al had a tavern in Bridgeport, Lithuanian tavern. And Al had a rooftop garden way before this. He used lard buckets. <laughs> he, had certain, he must have had a hundred of them. And they were pretty good. Square foot gardening, you know, he, he really was doing all right. And his sister had a restaurant down the block. So he'd give us cellar tomatoes and things like that. But yeah, you, you can do things very, very easily, like Al was doing and things like that. All right, we got time tonight. We got hours here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, this ball looks good morning tonight. I don't know what's with you. Yeah, you do. Um, seriously, regarding the railroad, though, oh, I'll, maybe I'll leave that for last. Um, you're eclectic. You're up against the business. Don't forget to be eclectic. What's my experience with Android business? During high school, I worked at the produce market. Uh, the volume of food that goes through there is just inconceivable. Uh, after college, I went and lived in rural areas for many, many years. The one thing that impressed me, though, was the scale of that right business. I mean, you look at what a con look at the equipment they have. I mean, a combine, I said, this is a mobile factory. You know? I mean, I actually got to drive one. It's like driving this room. <laughs> I'm serious. And then, you know, okay, some of these start. guys, they're getting, the farms are getting larger, and then, you know, you get a guy, like a guy gets on a tractor, and he drives all day yep. in a straight line. Yep. And he hasn't got the end of the farm. <laughs> now, there's another aspect of this. It's very commendable, the self-sustainability regarding food. But even this week, there was some thing, because they came down on this Romney guy, he doesn't care about the poor, but one of the things I read about was though that one out of six, at least the poor people in the United States, experience something called food insecurity. It's normally called hunger. But <laughs> they call it food insecurity now. Um, you know. And they are, but no, seriously, uh, yeah, are they doing a good job or a bad job? You know, the yes, the farmers are saying, yeah, we're producing all this food cheaply. Uh, what kind of food are they producing? You know, and what are they, and how are they doing it? Now the latest thing we're passing out, the chemical Roundup ain't any good anymore. They got to use a new one or something like that. Agent Orange. And good eco food, you know, I mean, the, you know, made by Frankenstein. Well, the last thing I wanted to say, since we're at the topic tonight, is ecology. We were marketing this railroad. We're just having fun. But, you know, what interests people in a railroad? And you could say, well, you know, they had to visit grandma, and we were looking at all the different features. And my friend was saying, well, we got to talk about oil and pollution and all this. And yet, sadly enough, they're not interested in that. Maybe the people in this room are, but 
you know, just sits back, is it? You know, they get questions like, well, how fast does it go? How much does it cost? And you try these global idea issues out there, and it's really kind of good. But it, it's like 5 or 10% of the audience. We're still, I think, talking to ourselves. Anyhow, I guess we've been at it for quite a few years. There is some, some light at the end of the tunnel. I think the younger generation is certainly taking this seriously. And I think the energy shortage certainly shook people around a little bit, you know. Um, but seriously, you know, I think we keep plugging, plugging away and okay, well, projects like yours and your tours, I think, you know, incrementally will get people into right thinking. But thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks, John, for an excellent presentation. One of the best ones I've seen here. I've been coming here for 10 years uh, regularly. It's so interesting. And I think we ought to thank Karina Shushime, I think, was the one who uh, decided to get John in here to speak. So thanks, Karina, for this time. Kind of excellent choice. Excellent, excellent speaker. Really, yeah, uh, really you. interesting. Uh, I've known John for quite a while, and you, you always sort of amaze me as like some kind of a superman that can take these projects that are like bewilderingly difficult and then turn them into gold. I mean, talk about gilding a turd. Man, you can do it. You, know, uh, you can't do that? You know, man, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing the things, the projects you take on and accomplish, you know, it's just phenomenal. And, uh, and it really, it does great things, you know, for the community and, uh, and everything and uh, generates, uh, you know, business and jobs and, uh, you know, it, it, it's, just, it's just wonderful. Uh, my, probably the only thing I'm probably uh, a little skeptical about is getting government grant money. I'd like to see this kind of thing being done without getting government grant money. I'd like to see it more, you know, private sector based. Why and don't we get like, some of it once in a while? And there's, uh, uh, well, everybody, you know, see, no raindrop feels responsible for the flood, you know, individually. It's all, but, you know, we start having all these government programs. But, you know, I think we need to have a, you know, a, a smaller government, less intrusive government. And our problem here is that you hear people over here constantly whining about capitalism. Well, it's because what we really have here is land monopoly capitalism. It's Our system is distorted by the ability of private ownership of land, which is a privilege, which then um, causes land speculation because the owners of land collect the economic, what's called the economic rent of land. And uh, people, the, um, that this is what causes spreading out, you know, sprawl. People, you know, the saying is drive until you qualify when you want to get a loan. That's because of, you know, people that have these, you know, have land uh, will sit and hold it off the market waiting for the price to rise. And then that, of course, makes the existing properties even more expensive. And then the price rises and fuel the speculative bubble like we just had right now. This is how all great you know, depressions and speculative bubbles arise through the private ownership of land. So, so some guy can sit around and collect rent, uh, you know, uh, for doing nothing. You know, so, you know, basically you have money for nothing, uh, collecting rent on land. Um, now, Henry George figured out the solution to this. He wasn't the one that discovered the distortion in the economy that, that you know, that land uh, causes. That was done way before the physiocrats, and David Ricardo wrote about it. Of course, Adam Smith, in the uh, conclusion of Book One of The Wealth of Nations, said, you know, all benefits of society accrue to the landowners. And the thing is that when you have a, ci a city, uh, everybody pays taxes. You know, even poor people, even renters pay taxes. But when, you know, the renters move on, you know, they've got nothing to show for it. But the, all the value that was those, those taxes paid for, like streets and uh, rapid transit systems and dams and bridges and lights and things like that, those all make the property values go up, and it's the landowner that benefits. So like everybody pays in, but only the landowners get the economic benefit. So, uh, but anyway, so that's a distortion. But anyway, the solution: land value taxation. Uh, our problem with the system that we have is that we don't tax, we let landowners pocket economic rent and 
to pay for the, the government then that we all need, uh, we have to charge good, take taxes on and products go. and taxes on income, which is essentially theft. You know, when, you, when you have to give the fruits of your labor to somebody else, we call that slavery. So the thing to do is to have a single tax on land is the ideal system. The birthright, all of our birthrights is, is the land. So people that want exclusive use to the land should pay the community for, a, for their rent. Income tax on the one percent. Come on, <laughs> that's where you get the money. Not He's on your house. <laughs> not on your house. Not on buildings. Yeah. Just on land. That's so. Income study tax. Henry George, and you'll see what it wants. It never really works to tax the rich, and the reason is because they tend to be. They could just raise their prices. Uh, you know, they tend to be self-employed. People always say, "Well, tax the rich. Tax these, yeah. tax these dentists that make two hundred fifty thousand a year." Why doesn't it work? Well, because when you go get a filling, uh, you know, it's going to be two hundred dollars instead of a hundred dollars. So this raise the price. So it never, never really works. But anyway, uh, John here is a good example of somebody who you get who has initiative. He's not sitting down on those Sal and Jackson with a sign whining, "Tax the rich and give me something." No, he's out there doing it. He took the initiative. He went out and got these buildings. He busts his tail well, six, seven yeah, days a week, it. shoveling, you know, concrete into wheelbarrows and, you know, running tubing and pipes and electricity and, you know, all hooking up furnaces and all that kind of stuff, doing that, doing that work and making things happen. And then other entrepreneurs are joining in, and again, driven by capitalism, they want with entering into it, voluntarily entering into a contract for their own self-interest, and they want to trade their products, they want free trade. Uh, so that's what it's all about is capitals. What we need is just to take the distortion of private ownership of land out of the capital, out of capital. No private and that would, that would solve about 90% of our problems. Then things would fall into place. What about unions? <laughs> not, that's not freedom, that's coercion. Hi, Rob Burns here. Uh, I want to second everybody else's uh, accolades. I think it's incredible what you're doing. Um, I'm an economist. I'm a former Green Party candidate, and I just think this is uh, revolutionary. I, I visited the website, and I really wanted to be here to see your talk, but when you're filling in the details and the things I missed because I didn't read the website well enough, uh, it just amazed me. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, as somebody who, who is very critical of capitalism, I, I think of the, the claims that this is capitalism as uh, something like the, uh, the kings, when they were approached by the early capitalists, the mercantilists, and they said, wow, this is all going to make me a better king. And I think if you're looking at this and thinking this is going to make a better capitalism, you're, you're missing how revolutionary uh, I think this really is, because this is putting, uh, to me, capitalism is, is the subordination of all other interests to capital to turn money into more money. So one way, you, you make land privately owned, and that will definitely subordinate the needs of human beings to turning money into more money. The best way to turn money into more money is make sure land is privatized and do all that. So what this does, though, is this puts you know, production in a community. And by doing that, uh, it, it lets the community express its will and its interests, even if it doesn't turn money into wild amounts of money. Uh, and I think that's that's really an important thing. So it may be that it's more much more profitable to make this produce in South America and ship it here, but it doesn't really help the community. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think that it's going to run up against this desire to uh, to uh, you know make things not local, um, even though consumers are saying we want local. It's not as profitable, um, but I think it, it's going to be better for us in the end. And I think. As an economist, I'm very interested. I know you, you, I, I agree with what you said about the economics of it today wouldn't do well for making coffee, for growing coffee and things like that. But I think uh, that economics may change and our and energy sources are limited. And we may find that we can't get coffee from South America at some point or it's going to be very, very costly to do so. So I would be interested in, uh, maybe in looking into this more of, uh, you know, I think it would be worthwhile for you even to like take a little bit aside and see if you can do some of these uh, less profitable but uh, you know interesting things. And that's why I think the grant, the grant money from the government, this is not the kind of thing that's already proven. And this is exactly where I think grant money from the government should go in something that's very promising but uh, has not been proven. Because once it's proven, obviously the, the, the credit will flow, uh, and you won't need grants. But uh, at this stage, you need them. So 
I was going to say, I, I'm also, as many of you know, I'm speaking at the, at the end of the month uh, on Path to Prosperity for Us All. It relates a little bit about uh, private ownership of land and that kind of thing. But I, I, was, I was taken by the project I've been working on, how I think it could have removed a lot of the obstacles that you complained about, the access to credit, the problems with the Norfolk and Southern, they wouldn't exist under what I'm proposing. Um, and we would have uh, community-based decision-making over what, what rails we have, what spurs we have off the rails and things like that. So, First of all, I would like to thank our speaker for a very, I mean, I say an exceptionally interesting talk tonight. And I was very glad to hear about all the work that you've been doing, which is very, very badly needed. And I was glad to hear about it. Uh, with regard to the comments that were made by our resident Georges not long ago, uh, I would like to say the following. First of all, Henry George, far from being a conservative, was a Christian socialist. And I'm not so sure that he'd be going along with everything that, that was said in his name a little while ago. Secondly, I, I remain convinced that the best answer to the problems, that, the questions that were raised, we need to take the top one or two percent of the wealthiest people in this country and raise their and raise the taxes on them back to where they were under Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman, as I've said before. And to take the Walmart of this, of, this, of this country and bring antitrust lawsuits and split them up into two or three separate competing companies. Um, second, last of all, I call it mighty brave talk from the citizen of a state that just passed a, a new state, a new statute making their state a right to work state, uh, trampling on the rights of workers all through Indiana. Uh, uh, I hope that the Hoosiers will see the light uh, in this election and throw in this November throw out Mitch Daniels yay. and the rest of the corrupt plums in the Republic yay. and dominate Indiana legislature. Thank you. Good idea. <laughs> Second round, people need to get up there. There's not a whole lot to rebut. So, uh, so first, uh, I only took a few notes here, but uh, in regards to the Chicago or one thing, I still feel cultural sciences, yes, uh, is a great place. And I forget who brought that up. Oh, okay. Um, and, uh, you know, we're starting to see aquaponics and agriculture creeping into quite a few schools, uh, which is a very good thing because. Uh, why this is important is this is a certain something that children don't learn these days so much, which is the concept of nurturing and of growing and working with their hands. Uh, and so um, uh, I think it's a very important concept for building connections within your brain. So using your hands to, to create is a, is a tremendously important thing. Um, I guess you've probably fairly accurately noticed that I'm pretty anti-corporate. I didn't really say that in the speech, but we're um, there's a movement right now uh, within the city to get Walmart and Walgreens to be the food desert distributors of organic produce. Which, yeah, I say boo, boo, boo. And uh, we are not interested in, no, we will not be selling our produce to either of those corporations. Uh, so uh, that's not the answer, you know, that's not the correct answer for sure. Um, so things are, uh, things are crashing, uh, as we've all noticed in the food systems and, and the way we grow food these days, uh, which is something that Dixon Despondia lays out very clearly in, uh, in, his, in his talks and his book about vertical farming. I don't agree with anything else he says, but uh, he's absolutely correct that we cannot continue to raise food the way we're doing it now in agribusiness and, and the way commodities are, are produced is uh, a dead-end street that's just getting worse and worse. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, the more food that can be raised uh, absolutely as locally as possible, even in your own house, the better. Uh, we all stand to benefit from that. Somebody talked about uh, small turbines and digester, digesters. Yes. Um, in, in Germany, there are many uh, municipal digesters that are 
starting to power neighborhoods, you know, well, starting to power things like the street lights in a neighborhood, for instance. So taking the municipal waste. Actually, uh, right here in Downers Grove, they have a, uh, an anaerobic digester that uh, consumes uh, waste from the sewer system that comes in and all sorts of other things like people's cell phones and whatnot. And uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, something whose time has come. And as we build more of these, they will get cheaper and cheaper for sure which they need to, and it can be done on lots of uh, scale. Uh, our turbine, by the way, our gigantic 500-kilowatt uh, turbine is about this big. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Like this. Will those digesters digest plastic shit? No. <laughs> they won't. Uh, that's, a, that's one of the only things that they won't uh, uh, deal with. Um, I would... Uh, uh, I would suggest that they, they can also be used, well, it can be used for human waste, or if you're looking for an, uh, an eco uh, burial, uh, yeah. it could be potentially a, a, uh, something you could resort to as opposed to <laughs> cremation or a burial. Yay! Anyway. Soil and green. Soil and green. Something. So, never mind about that. Um, so, the other. Uh, uh, the other thing uh, mentioned briefly was uh, about uh, uh, burning wood to drive cars around. Um, I'm not a big fan of driving cars around, first off, uh, or, or burning wood. But uh, we actually have such a thing. It's called a gasifier. And uh, you can take biomass and put it in there and, uh, and get burnable gas, which can then be used to make energy and electricity and motion and all those sorts of things. Uh, it's also a... Um, it's a good way if you have a bunch of waste that you don't know what else to do with it, that's why you want to get rid of it. So, uh, all of this kind of points back to the amount of waste uh, everywhere, particularly in this country, uh, that, that goes into landfills and, and, uh, and everywhere else into the air, uh, is so valuable. And it's just kind of astonishing to me what, that we bury this stuff. So, um, you know, that's... Uh, that's one of those things that has to change if we're going to survive. So, uh, with that, uh, thank you so much. And, uh, so valuable. Come on, guys. Come on. And thank you all for coming, and I hope to see you again. We were Thank you for it. If you have trouble with it, I'm working on a computer pretty well. Otherwise, if you use wrong, I can only make a replacement or something. So, you know, eating hard. That's fine. I'll see you in a minute. Thank you.